we have seen a drastic change in regard to standards and values held by the majority of people, particularly in the area of morals, social conduct, family structure, beginning all the way back to time shortly in the aftermath of World War I, we have seen a drastic change in what had been accepted mores and standards, accepted moral values. Youth has been the cutting edge of the social rebellion from the time of the flappers of the Roaring Twenties all the way down to the beginning of the rock and roll generation back in the early mid-50s, continuing on through the era of protest and rebellion of the 60s, continuing on into the 70s with the same thing, drug culture, uh, the hippies, the whole thing. Actually, when you look at it, when you look at the, the effect, and it's certainly an effect that has gone far beyond uh, simply the youth, because as they have gotten older, uh, then the next generation has come along and has actually gone further, and the problems have been perpetuated and have basically worsened from generation to generation. Uh, there have been certain things that kind of uh, come in and put a put a clamp on things when you look at the, the trend of, of uh, society, the, the way things go. Uh, the uh, It seems like, you know, traditionally sin is for good times. So in the roaring economic uh, conditions of the roaring 20s, it was also uh, a very decadent time from a moral standpoint uh, with the collapse and the depression of the 30s. Uh, there was a certain tightening down, a certain return to some values, um, but uh, those things I have long since uh, skidded by the board. Actually, when you look at it from an overall standpoint, it is simply uh, a logical conclusion uh, of the trend of Western thought, uh, tracing all the way back to the time of the Renaissance and the Reformation, uh, which in some ways held up the ideal of the individual doing and following, you know, the... the, the uh, a deification almost of the individual will, the individual idea, uh, as opposed to any central authority. And we have seen a continuation of that type of thing all the way down to the kind of do-your-own-thing uh, type of an approach. And as I say, we've seen these things, we've seen it particularly in the 20th century. Uh, you can go into various aspects of the moral, social changes, family changes uh, that have occurred in our society in recent times, recent decades. There is one commandment which if it had been followed, if it were followed, if it were properly understood, would have prevented the sickening slide which is worsened with each successive generation. And I would like for us to examine this particular commandment this afternoon and understand a little bit not only of where our society is, but partially how it got this way, and how that the results that we see are the result of broken laws. They're the result of the transgression of the law of God. Now, the Apostle Paul prophesied of our society. Perhaps we do not normally think of the Apostle Paul as a prophet, and he was not in the classical sense of the term, and yet he did write a prophecy, he wrote several but the one is found in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This know also, that in the last day, now we are living in the last days, and that can be proven and demonstrated in many ways. In fact, all you have to do really is just read the next few verses. This know also, that in the last days, perilous times shall come, dangerous times, treacherous times, for men shall be Lovers of their own self. First and foremost, that phraseology describes our society, the me generation. Lovers of their own selves, covetous. Again, an excellent description of our society. Boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Now that, again, very aptly describes our society. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Going on, describing things in verse 4, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. 
I think that's, you know, very aptly proven. You know, where do you think most people are interested in going? To a ball game or uh, a Sabbath service to hear God's Word expounded? Uh, well, I think the answer is very self-evident. You know, we're not in the Astrodome, are we? Uh, we're here in a uh, you know, relatively small little auditorium. So, it says, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. That describes it. But all of these factors describe us, and one of those factors is the factor of disobedience to parents. Now, that characterizes our society in a way that has not been the characteristic of other societies. That doesn't mean that other societies have been perfect, that other generations, other times in history, everything's been just right, everything's been great, and our, our, our times, things are rotten. No, there have always been problems. But certain of these problems have come to a head and are evident in our time, in our society, our generation, in a way that they were not and have not been at other times. Let's notice another prophecy back in Isaiah 3. Isaiah chapter 3, verse, verse 1, we'll begin. For behold, the Lord, the eternal of hosts, does take away from Jerusalem, from Judah, the stay and the staff, the whole stay of bread, the whole stay of water, the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient, Captain of fifty, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning artificer, the eloquent orator, you know, the great man. Because they're going to pass away. And I will give children to be their apprentices, and babes shall rule over them. The people shall be oppressed, every one by another, and every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, and the base against the honorable. Things are going to be turned upside down, God says. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient. Well, that has not always been a characteristic of, our, uh, of society. It has not always been a characteristic of Western society. But it certainly has in recent times. When you look at the riots, the rebellion, the protest movement, uh, the general disrespect for authority, the, re- the general disrespect for any source of central absolute authority. And when you erode that respect for authority, you erode the foundation of every other factor, of every other value and standard. God goes on, verse 12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your path. So God goes on and he talks about the society that we live in, the upside-down values. Uh, the youth rebellion, the women's lib movement, the whole thing that is characteristic of our society. Notice on back in Micah chapter 7, very important prophecy. We'll pick it up in verse 2. The good man is perished out of the earth. There is none upright among men. You know, the old standards, the old values, have passed, have passed by the wayside. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man, his brother, with a net. You know, there was a time when there were certain values, certain standards, uh, from an ethical and a moral standpoint, that held sway in society. When people prided themselves on the statement, my word is my bond. Handshake is good as a contract. You know, I was reading a piece in the paper just the other day, and it was, it was kind of interesting, some of the points that it made made the statement, or the observation, it said, you know, if there's one lawyer in a town, he'll starve to death. If there are two lawyers, they'll get rich. Uh, the idea being, you know, they have each other to suit uh, and to uh, litigation back and forth. Did you know that lawyers in the state of Texas uh, outnumber doctors? In fact, lawyers in the state of Texas outnumber the inmates in CDC. Uh, there are more lawyers in Texas than there are anything else, except, uh, uh, well, I don't know what else, but they, they outnumber just about everything. And uh, it seems that, uh, you know, the tribe increases. Well, of course, the reason that it does is described here in the latter part of verse 2. They hunt every man, his brother, with a net. Everybody's seeking to, tra- to trap up, uh, to entrap someone else. That they may do evil with both hands earnestly. The prince asks, the judge asks for a reward. The great man, he utters his mischievous desire. So they wrap it up. Does that sound like some of that ab scam, you know, and, and, and uh, those things that they, they had, Watergate, some of that. The great man, he utters his mischievous desire. 
and they wrap it up. Boy, they wrapped it up all right. They had pictures of them right there while they were uttering their mischievous desire. If you ever, if you saw any of that on television, you know, they just roll the cameras. And there the guy was. He was just sitting there, his eyes bulging, you know, ready to, ready to pass out the dough. He was sitting there on the tape. He asked for a reward. God goes on to say the best of them is as a briar. The most upright is sharper than a thorn head. The day of your watchman and your visitation comes, now shall be their perplexity. Trust you not in a friend, put you not confidence in a guide, keep the doors of your mouth from her that lies in your bosom, for the son dishonors the father, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, a man's enemies, are the men of his own house. Therefore, I will look unto the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. Look, don't put your, don't put your trust in this society, in the politics and in the solution that this society holds out. God says, look, you better not trust them, you know, they're sharper than a thorn hedge. There's, there, there's uh, crooked things going and coming. Even the family structure is breaking down. Families turning against one another. The son dishonors the father. The daughter rises up against the mother. That undermines the entire structure of society, the entire structure of morals and standards and values, because it undermines the most elemental building block of society. It undermines the family, which is the source of authority and of teaching a child about authority and of learning a respect and a regard for authority. So as a result of the family being undermined, society has been undermined and totters on the brink. Let's notice what God said. God's commands, if they had been heeded, would have certainly remedied the situation and would have prevented the circumstances that we see now gripping our society uh, from ever having taken place. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12, we read the simple statement, Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long upon the land which the eternal your God gives you. Very simple statement, very simple sentence. Honor your father and your mother, your parents. They are worthy of special honor, of special recognition. About what he desires in us. Let's notice, as it is restated a little bit further, back in Leviticus chapter 19, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 3, another statement, very simple, part of God's basic law is given here, the principle is stated in Leviticus 19, 2, that you are to be holy, for I, the eternal, your God, am holy. God begins to go through in detail and define what is acceptable conduct on a personal basis. He starts with the statement, the observation, the requirement that the people of God must be holy, because God is holy. And then the very first statement he makes is, You shall fear every man, his mother and his father, and keep my Sabbath. I am the eternal your God. One is the basis of your relationship with your neighbor. The commandment which underpins society, and that is reverence for parents. The other is to keep my Sabbath, because that has to do with your relationship with God, that defines for you who God is, reminds you that he is the creator, and is a sign between the two, between you and God. He goes on and goes into idolatry and various other things, goes into various principles of loving your neighbor. I'm not going to go through all of it. But notice that when God gets ready to start off talking about holy conduct, the very first place he focuses attention is you shall fear every man. His father and his mother fear, not in the sense of hide in the corner and be scared of, be frightened of, but you shall stand in awe, in respect, in reverence of your father and your mother. You are to honor them. You are to venerate them. You are to highly esteem them. You are to fear them in the sense of deep respect, standing in a certain amount of awe. On down in verse 32, is the statement, You shall rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear your God. I am the eternal. 
Now, this is certainly based on the principle of honoring your parents, and that principle, by implication, would teach you to honor those, show respect to those that are older. We should certainly do that, you know, as we deal with, with older people, and we should teach our children that, you know, to use uh, titles of respect and courtesy when addressing older people, to stand up when an older person comes in the room, uh, to hold the door open for an older person, to show great esteem and great respect. That's a very important lesson, and, and that, is, that is contrary to the trend of our society, and too many of us have gotten into that uh, type of a habit. But it goes hand in hand with honoring your parents, and by implication, honoring those who are older than you. Showing respect, as it says, to the hoary head or the white hair. You know, showing great respect to that, that individual, rising up before them, honoring them, referring to them in a respectful manner, teaching our children to do so, not uh, being in a sense of, of overly familiar, not, not, in a, not in a wrong way, not in a, in, in a way of dishonoring, disrespectful. God makes a statement in Proverbs chapter 10. This is the way, you know, how do you honor your parents? We're going to see that a little bit later, but notice right here, this is a commandment that is, is certainly aimed directly uh, at children, and we're all children, you know, we, we've all, uh, we all have parents, some of our parents are dead, others are still living, some of us are young children, others of us are old children, uh, but we're all children, we're all sons and daughters of someone. These commandments are aimed at all of us, therefore. Now, in Proverbs 10, 1, it defines for us how we are to, you know, how do you uh, initiate this command? How do you apply it? Well, we're told, a wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. How do you show honor? How do you make your parents glad? Well, learn wisdom. A wise son makes a glad father. A foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. So now we're going to go into that in a little bit as to how we do that, but that defines it for us simply. That is the basis. That's a part of how you honor your parents by using wisdom, being wise, not being foolish in your conduct. Now, why does God make such an important statement? Why does, why does God lay such great emphasis on the importance of honoring parents? Well, to begin with, with early childhood, the parents stand in the place of God. You know, what is a parent? Well, first and foremost, the parent is to the child the life giver, the source of life. That's first and foremost why you honor your parents, because your life came from them for the important reason, you would not be here. You would not be drawing breath on this earth if it weren't for your parents. Pretty important reason to show honor and to show respect because you owe to them your very existence. They stand in the role of life giver. To a small child, a parent also stands in the role of the protector, the provider, the sustainer, you know, you depend on your parents. You depend on them for the things that you have. And so the parent, in that sense, represents, stands in the role of God to the child. Now, the relationship the child establishes with his parents will carry over as he gets older, will carry over to the relationship that that child is able to establish with God. The attitude of respect for authority will carry over. The child does not learn to respect his parents, to respect their authority. The child will not learn to respect authority, period. Because that is the first authority with whom the child comes in conduct, in contact. And his conduct in regards to that figure of authority, that source of authority, is going to affect the child. It is 
it is very important. And certainly we as parents have a very important role, and I hope to stress as we go through to understand our role in teaching our children this commandment. Because you, I, think, I think we can understand, brethren, what is the first commandment you can teach a child? What is the first commandment that a child can learn to keep? Well, the commandment to honor his parents. See, that is a commandment that a little small child can learn to keep. It has an application for a small child. Some of the other commandments really uh, don't. At least, well, they do to a degree. They do in principle. But a child can a child can understand what it means to obey daddy and mommy a long time before he can really comprehend what it means to kill someone or to commit idolatry or to take God's name in vain or to properly uh, hallow the Sabbath in the spiritual sense or to commit adultery or, uh, you know, to steal or various of the other commandments. He can understand, he can relate to what it means to honor his parents to do what daddy and mommy say. Because if he doesn't learn to keep that commandment, he won't learn to keep the others. Because the only reason he's going to keep the others is because, you know, daddy and mommy say to. Daddy and mommy say it's wrong to lie. It's wrong to take something that does not belong to you. And then by implication, as the child gets older, the other commandments come into play as they begin to have, uh, to deal with situations that will have an impact on his life. But if a child does not learn to honor and respect and obey his parents, then the very most fundamental thing has already been undermined and his whole relationship and respect for authority, for law, if you will, for those in a position of authority, has already been undermined. So it is extremely important to properly learn that. Now, God placed great emphasis on properly honoring our parents. In fact, it was a very serious matter, and under the Old Covenant, under the civil statute, God was dealing with Israel as a civil nation. There was a very great penalty attached. It ought to make us realize the seriousness of some of the things that we have taken lightly. Why have we taken it lightly? We have to understand, and I hope as we go through and focus in on various of God's commandments, that we will understand how totally false, how totally perverted, how totally distorted are the values of our society, values we have grown up with. And to understand as we begin to go through and focus in detail on what God says in terms of the commandments that constitute his basic law, that define for us a proper relationship with God and with our fellow man, define for us the whole basis of what is right and wrong, as we begin to go through and focus on those, I hope that we come to understand more fully the fact that our society is a source of wrong values and that all of us have absorbed a certain amount of them and have been tainted with them. We have to examine ourselves and compare ourselves with the Word of God and go to God to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and to be transformed in our thinking to replace the false values with the truth. Notice, for instance, in Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 16, Here we have the blessings and the cursings. Deuteronomy chapter 27, 16, it says, Cursed be he that sets life by his father or his mother. And all the people shall say, Amen. That sets light by. In other words, that lightly is seen. That looks down on or that dishonors. There are other command, there are other statements that even make it more explicit as to what is involved. God says you're under a curse if you do that. He says you're going to be blessed if you honor them. He says you're under a curse if you lightly esteem, set light by your parents. Don't take seriously their wishes. Notice back in the statutes and judgments that were to amplify the Ten Commandments for the Old Covenant in Leviticus, or in uh, Exodus rather, Exodus chapter 21 and verse 15. 
Here is a very strong statement. He that smites his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. It was a capital crime in ancient Israel to strike your parents. He that smites his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. You know, that's a serious matter. Because God understood and wanted the people to understand that the most fundamental thing before anything else could be taught, they had to learn a deep, abiding respect for authority. And if they could not learn and did not have a deep, abiding respect for authority built in season, then they would be unable to learn and to apply anything else. And those that were just absolutely rebellious and had no regard and no esteem for those above them were simply eliminated from the society. He that smites his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. Down in verse 17. He that curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. You did not have to pick up, you know, pick up something and hit them, double up your fist and, and, and slug them one to curse or revile your parents. To curse or to revile. The margin renders it revile. Speak again. To revile your parents was a capital crime. Very alien to the thinking of our society. You know, where child psychologists tell you, oh, you know, you ought to encourage your children to tell you if they hate you, you know, and the little child says, I hate you, mommy. And the child psychologist says, you're, and you're supposed to stand there and say, yes, I understand that, dear. I used to hate my mother, too. And, uh, you know, go right along. Garbage. Of course, that's the reason that that gets back to the whole concept of our society. That is why we're a society based on rebellion. Because there is not a fundamental respect for authority, for constituted authority. Deuteronomy 21, 18. If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him and bring him unto the elders of the city, and under the gate of his place, and they shall say unto the elders of the city, This our son is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. You know, he's a hippie. He's a dropout. He's a he's a uh, he's a turned on, tuned out, and everything else. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he dies. So he shall put away evil from among you, and all Israel shall hear and fear. Brethren, that was the law of God under the Old Covenant. God was dealing with a civil nation, with a carnal people. That is the way that God dealt with the situation. God did not take it as a light matter. God did not lightly esteem it as something that was a little thing. It was a very serious matter to dishonor your elders, to dishonor your parents to revile, to speak against them. So I, I think that we have not, in many cases, recognized the seriousness. And you think, oh, well, you know, this is, they were pretty harsh under the Old Covenant, weren't they? Well, no more than God is right now, because you see, honor your father and your mother is still one of the ten, isn't it? What is it if you dishonor your father and your mother? Well, it's a sin. 1 John 3, 4, sin is the transgression of the law. But when you dishonor your parents, you transgress the law, haven't you? What is the wages of sin? Well, the wages of sin is death. So you see, really, God hasn't changed anything, has he? The death penalty is not being administered here and now. Uh, the death penalty will be administered, though, known as the lake of fire. We either repent and turn away from that type of thing and are cleansed from it by the shed blood of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, or God will simply eliminate us because that is not 
that is not the, the way or the basis of anything that God wants to perpetuate into the world tomorrow. It is a fundamental commandment. And it, is, it serves as a bridge between the first four and the latter five. It is the one that bridges the gap, you know, that it's number five. And uh, it bridges the gap between love toward God and love toward neighbor. Because God is in that sense our Father, and we are to honor Him. And our parents are the first neighbors with whom we come in contact. And if we do not learn to honor our parents, then we will, it's very doubtful that we will be able to show love to any of our other neighbors that we come in contact with later. In fact, as we go through, I think that we can come to see, I've got a number of clippings here, I don't know that I'll have time to get into them, but we will come to see that it is so extremely important for the development of a child to be properly taught how to honor his parents and for the parents to recognize their responsibility in the teaching of this commandment in enabling a child to grow up with a proper sense of self-esteem, a proper sense of love and of discipline, of, of order, of respect. Because if the child does not learn to respect others, he will ultimately be unable to even respect himself. Now, let's notice exactly how we put the fifth commandment into practice. We focus on the importance of it, on the fact that God indicts our society through prophecy for the results of transgression of the fifth commandment. We see that God commands us to honor our parents, and we see that it was a very serious matter, a very serious infraction, and should result was considered a capital crime in ancient Israel to transgress that commandment. So it is a very important matter. How do we go about putting it into practice? How do we go about actually inculcating it into our lives and understanding more clearly what the commandment entails? Let's notice in Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29 and verse 15. Now we read a little earlier in Proverbs 10 that a wise son makes a glad father. A foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. So it is wise conduct which enables you to honor your parents. Wise conduct enables you to honor your parents. Now, how can you parents enable your children to conduct themselves wisely? How can you teach your children to keep the fifth commandment? Notice Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings his mother to shame. A child left to himself brings his mother to shame. A child left to himself does not bring honor to his parents. A child left to himself does not honor his parents. A child left to himself brings shame to his parents, brings disgrace to his parents. So to allow a child to just kind of run wild, to just go, it's not doing that child a favor. It's not showing love to the child. There was an interesting article in the Christian Science Monitor back a little while ago. The headline is, Real Culprit Found in War Against Drug Abuse. Found out. After years of experimentation, research, and sometimes pure guesswork, a number of professionals in the war against drug abuse have concluded the problem is not drugs after all. The real culprits these professionals believe are alienation, boredom, loneliness, and low self-esteem. The new program is a response to a recent survey of about 600 suburban high school students here showing about 7 in 10, about 70%. Have a sense of feeling removed, not cared for, generally alienated. Now this particular researcher went on to add that if alienation, loneliness, and boredom are accepted as some of the prime causes of youthful drug abuse, then the study shows the seeds of that problem are not going away, but are in fact expanding. There are many, many things that could be gone into along that line. 
curious, this is from an article in U.S. News and World Report, the title of which is a special series, a section on the family. The title of this article was, His Parents' Influence Fade, Who's Raising the Children? The youngsters who are getting the heaviest impact of big changes in U.S. family life. Serious concern is developing about the future of the nation's children now being caught up in family change. Behind that concern, more than 30% of school-age children are living with parents who have been divorced at least once. Because of rising rates of divorce, desertion, and illegitimacy, one-sixth of all U.S. children under 18 live in one parent family. At the same time, a majority of American mothers of school-age children now hold jobs outside the home, delegating child care increasingly to schools, nurseries, and babysitters, many of them government-supported. And, of course, our government uh, uh, operates on the principles that the last thing in the world that they're what they can do is teach your children uh, right and wrong, because you see, they don't claim to know what's right and wrong, no absolute. Uh, they've got to kick God out of the classroom, uh, therefore there's no basis for teaching ethics and morals and standards and values that there are absolutes. Off the uh, family is often dominated by what one psychologist calls the flickering blue parent. Television. Serving as babysitter, educator, mind former, and electronic tranquilizer. Occupational mobility forces the average family to move once every five years, reinforcing the image of the home as a place where parents and children cross paths occasionally on the way to and from other pursuits. Under such pressures, child rearing today is exacting a high toll on emotions for both parents and children, bringing to many families a widening generation gap of mutual hostility, suspicion, simply non-communication. Many parents feel that their traditional values have had their day and are out of date. In order to stay in fashion, they've loosened up, but in so doing, they've come up with no new values. The result is that many children today live in a moral and emotional vacuum without any goals to strive for. At least one million, the result of that is at least one million Amer young Americans, most of the middle class, run away from home each year. Over one million children run away from home every year. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for young Americans between the ages of 15 and 24. Suicide. By 17, one out of ten American women, married and unmarried, is a mother. One out of nine ends up in juvenile court by age 18. Approximately 10% of all school-age children have moderate to severe mental and emotional trouble. Drug abuse and alcoholism among teenagers are becoming serious public health problems. There are other things that we could go into. God says here, the rod and reproof give wisdom. A combination of ingredients. The rod and reproof. See, that means discipline, rod, that's, that's like a twist or a belt or something to use to spank with, or the rod, and reproof, that's instruction, that's teaching, that's explanation, it's not just a matter of getting frustrated and walloping the kid, God says the rod and reproof, he didn't say take your choice, use one or the other, he said use them both, well, maybe some don't agree with that, well your disagreement is with God what God says. He says the rod and reproof. Discipline, spanking, and instruction, teaching, give wisdom. That source of in that combination of instruction and discipline. Of saying this is the way, walk you in it, and that being enforced. That gives wisdom. And a wise son, we read a little earlier, makes a glad father. The way a child learns to honor his parents is by developing wisdom. A child left to himself brings his mother to shame. Just turn them loose, let them, let them just grow. Let them just, just go, you know, do what they want to do, just run with the pack. Have the run of the neighborhood. That kind of child will bring his mother to shame. That kind of child will not honor his parents. Because frankly, his parents have not honored him by letting him go. 
God says in verse 17, Correct your son, and he shall give you rest. Yea, he shall give thee life unto your soul. So God says it's very important to teach them, to correct them, to chasten them, to discipline them. If you do that, they will give you rest. Not wear you out, not be a weariness unto you, but they'll give you rest. They will be a delight to you. Now, notice in Proverbs 31, we see here in Proverbs 29, if you want your child to honor you, you want to teach your child to honor you as his parent, well, what, is, well, what do you need to do? Well, you need to discipline them. You need to teach them. What else? And let's notice in, in Proverbs 31 on down here in, in uh, verse 28. This is in the section talking about the virtuous woman. And it went through here and it talks all the way through, beginning in verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman or price is far above rubies? The heart of her husband does safely trust in her. She'll do him good, not evil, all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax, works willingly with her hands. Uh, she takes care of her household, we see in verse 15. Uh, she does various things. Uh, she takes care of the clothing for the family. Uh, she does many things. We're told in verse 25, strength and honor are her clothing. She shall rejoice in time to come. Verse 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. You know, she doesn't just sit there watching soap operas from sun up to sundown. Uh, that's not the way she spends her time. That's not, you know, the description we read in Proverbs 31. She looks well to the ways of her household and eats not the bread of idleness. And what is the result of that? Verse 28, her children arise up and call her blessed. Her, her husband also, and he praises her. Now here, in this, this expression, call her blessed, could also be rendered just simply, make her happy. Her children arise up, her children grow up, and make her happy. Now what? They call her blessed. They honor her. They respect her. They reverence her. What? Well, as you read Proverbs 31, the conclusion you have to come to is primarily because of her example. Why do her children... Bless her and honor her and make her happy. Because of the example she has set, as a result of what she has done, her children honor and respect her. They make her happy. They call her blessed. So what do we have? We have a combination here that, on the one hand, discipline, teaching, and, you know, discipline, which is a combination of teaching and chastening, combines with parental example to lead to obedience to the fifth commandment. How do you as a parent inculcate in your child obedience to the fifth commandment? Number one, by your own example. By the way you conduct yourself. By teaching them, by exercising discipline, teaching them in the right way. Example goes a long way. Well, the basis, we're told, for instance, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, God deals with us by example. He also deals with us by chastening and by teaching. And He also deals with us by example. See, they're, they're all, all three methods are used. And they all three have their place. Too many times, some of us have wanted to focus on just one of them. Oh yeah, boy, I'm rearing my kid. Yeah, I take the belt to him every night. There's a little more to it than that. That's not all there is to child rearing. You know, just hit them on the rear a few times until you figure you have reared them. Well, that's, uh, you know, that has its place. But that's not all there is by a long shot. We're told, for instance, in 1 John 4.19, speaking of, of our relationship to God, we're told that we love him because he first loved us. We respond to God's example. How do we learn to love God? Why do we love God? We love God because God loved us first. God manifested his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're told back in Romans 5. 
See, God manifested His love to us first, then we gradually learn to respond to that love and to love God. Then a little child comes into the world, and that little child, the whole world, is himself. He is concerned for himself. You know, he is the epitome of selfishness. Not, you know, from a willful standpoint, but because that's, yeah, that's all he knows. That is all he's aware of. If he's hungry, if he's wet, if he's uncomfortable, if he's comfortable, I want to be that way right now. But you know, as, as the mother, and, and start with the mother because she normally has more uh, intimate and direct contact, and she holds and nourishes and cares for that little child, you know, it's not long you, that, that the little baby begins to recognize mommy. And, you know, he, he, the, little, the little baby develops a smile for mommy that he doesn't have for anybody else. And the little child begins to respond to mommy and respond to daddy. And they'll come to mommy and daddy in a way that maybe they won't quite as freely to someone else. And th- as that child gets a little older and a little older and a little older, that bond of love grows and grows and grows. The child learns to love because it is love. And a child who's not loved doesn't learn to love. Now, you know, that's the way we learn to love God. We, we learn to love God because God loves us. And our love to God is a reflection of His love to us. And a child's love to his parents is a reflection of the love of that parent to the child. So, by, the, by parental example, a child learns to honor his parents. Now, parental example includes various things. It includes the parent's attitude toward the child. Their attitude of love and concern toward the child. And, that, and that's, you know, the first thing the child begins to pick up on. That this is his source of nourishment. This is his source of, of security. This is, these, you know, are the arms that, that, that hold him and comfort him. This is his whole source of, of security and of love and of, and of uh, warmth and tenderness. And so the child first begins to respond to the attitude of his parent toward him. And as the child gets older, they still respond to that. That attitude. They, another part of the parental example is the parent's personal conduct. You know, as the child begins to get older and, and is taught various things, or right and wrong, they also begin to notice what their parents do and how their parents react, how their parents handle situations. And so they, the way in which the parents conduct themselves, we see, we see right here an example in, in Proverbs 31. You know, the example, the personal conduct of the mother resulted in the attitude that her children had toward her. I think another part of the parental example that has its effect on the child learning to properly honor their parents is even the attitude of the parents toward their own parents. You know, as the child gets older and they begin to pick up, they begin to see how you treat your parents. And they begin to pattern themselves and they begin to think in those terms. Don't think that you can dishonor your parents as an adult and expect your child to properly honor and respect and esteem you. They simply won't do it. Not really, not in the way that they should, not in the way that, that they could as properly, as proper example is passed. Another thing that is a very important part of the parental example in teaching a child to honor his parents is the attitude of the parent toward one another. The attitude of the parent toward one another. You know, when the parents argue and fight and bicker and call names and, 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 and criticize and condemn one another back and forth, they are undermined. You know, don't think that you're going to get your child and he's going to side in with you and boy, he's really going to be down on the other one because you told him what a dirty rotten so-and-so, you know, their dad or their mom was. Well, they'll, they might disrespect the other one, but they'll disrespect you too. You will undermine their respect for both of you. Very important. You know, and I, I think as we get older... We can look back more and more on the example that our own parents set and realize the effect 
and the impact that that has had on us and our relationship with them. Very important. Parents should never criticize and condemn and put down one another in front of their children. Should never call one another harsh names or things like that. In fact, you shouldn't do that, period. Calling one another names. You know, there might be times when parents would disagree on something, when they need to discuss a problem. But the time to do it and the place to do it is not in front of the children. Because what you do is you undermine their respect for both of you. When you don't support one another and back one another up. And show that honor and that respect for each other. When dad doesn't honor and respect mom and back her up and support her. And when mom doesn't respect and venerate dad and back him up and support him all the way, then they both undermine the respect that their children can have for either one or both of them. So one of the main ways in teaching this commandment to your children or be right here, we have the matter of example, the example that you set in your own life, coupled with the discipline that is a part of the household uh, conduct. And discipline consists of both chastening and teaching. Now, there's much positive teaching that ought to come from parents. That if a child will honor his parents, a child who is honoring his parents will be doing these things. Because to honor your parents means you're going to be listening to what they say. This is not just written for, the Bible is not just written for older people. There's a commandment that applies very directly, and any of you that are old enough to understand the words that I'm speaking, you're old enough to realize that what is being said applies to you. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and forsake not the law of your mother. They shall be an ornament of grace under your head and chains about your neck. Chains in the sense of, of decorative chains, you know, like a necklace or something. Hear the instruction of your father. Don't forsake the law of your mother. Learn to do what your parents teach you. That will set you apart. Very important. That's an important part. Honoring your parents, learning to follow their instructions. We go on in, in Proverbs chapter 3, for instance. Again, verse 1, My son, forget not my law, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of day and long life and peace shall they add to you. Now that's very similar, of course, to the statement that God made, Honor your father and your mother, that your days might be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. Here he says, you know, don't forget my law, son. Keep my commandments. Do what I tell you to do. Honor your parents. See, uh, you do that by doing this, by, by following their, their teaching. Do what they tell you to do. Because that will lead to length of days, long life, peace. Well, they teach you things. They teach you things about safety. They teach you things, all kinds of things as you go on through in, in chapter, uh, Chapter 3, many practical considerations. Chapter 4, again the same thing. Talking about wisdom. Verse 7, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. With all you're getting, get understanding. A wise son makes a glad father. The way to really honor your parents is to learn wisdom and apply it. We can go on to chapter 6. Notice in verse 20 some of the instruction that is given. An important part of honoring your parents showing part of the role that the parents are to play in the lives of their children. My son, keep your father's commandment and forsake not the law of your mother. Bind them continually upon your heart and tie them about your neck. When you go, it shall lead you. When you sleep, it shall keep you. And when you awake, it shall talk with you. For the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. To keep you from the evil woman, from the flattery of the tongue of a strange woman. Lust not after her beauty in your heart, neither let her take you with her eyelids. For by means of a whorish woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread, and the adulteress will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom, and his clothes not be burned? 
Can one go upon hot coals and his feet not be burned? So he that goes into his neighbor's wife, whosoever touches her shall not be innocent. Now, it goes on in verse 32, whoso lacks, whoso commits adultery with a woman lacks understanding. He that does it destroys his own soul. Now, here it makes very plain that one of the things that parents should teach their children about is sex and marriage. That is not something that is primarily to be taught in the school. It is not to be taught by strangers according to the law of God in Proverbs chapter 6. We find the example and the statement made that children are to be instructed in sex and marriage by their parents. Their parents are to warn them. You know, Dad, Mom, sit down and talk to them. Now here it is talking, the principle applies to, to, to boys and girls. Here it applies uh, here the, the statement is being made uh, to the son, which is instruction to the, to the son, you know, not a double standard here, about avoiding uh, loose women, about avoiding fornication, instruction about the right kind of dating practice, about the kind of things that should not be done between unmarried people. Being on the lookout, being aware of what's going on, not being unwise as to who they are to associate with, with whom they are to spend time, even in regards to dating, the kinds of people that are acceptable, that are unacceptable. A child who is trying to honor his parents will consider their wishes, their guidance. This is not saying that the parent is supposed to sit down and, and, and just arbitrarily kick out somebody and say, that's the one, but they're to give guidance, they're to give principles. And the, and the child he, he should very much consider their wishes, should honor them by trying to uphold the standards that they've been taught. You know, it implies even the right kind of pride in your heritage, your family heritage, which would certainly include even your, your ethnic and racial heritage. That is an extension of your parents, you know, your forebearers. That in honoring your parents, you're not going to someone who properly learns to honor their parents to take the right kind of pride in their heritage. It's not a matter of some great big inferiority complex, and, and uh, uh, but a matter of the proper, not a, not a pride in the sense of vanity, but the right kind of of, uh, of honor, of respect, of happiness at the heritage that you have been blessed with, of feeling good about and of trying to honor and to uphold that heritage in your conduct. Let's notice as we go into the New Testament some more statements in terms of proper parental child relationship. Notice back in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Do what your parents say. Now, it makes the one condition in the Lord in the sense that as a child gets older and reaches maturity uh, and comes to understand God's way, that uh, particularly in certain cases, maybe a, a child, maybe the parents are not in the church, maybe they don't understand God's way, and there might on occasion uh, be situations that would arise where you have to obey God rather than men. It doesn't say disrespect your parents, though. It says, obey them in the Lord, and I think that would be an extremely rare situation. No one has the right uh, to command you uh, to disobey God. You know, nobody can tell you, okay, take this gun and go out and shoot somebody, or go out and commit adultery with somebody, or go out and steal from somebody, or tell a lie on my behalf. You see, God commands us as to what to do. I don't think this is uh, something that is, you know, a very normal situation or something that would... It would happen very often, but we but that is the one condition that is given. Obey your parents in the Lord. You know, 
unless what they say would directly contradict what God commands, and you know that that's what God commands. This is right. And in any regard, regardless of, of, uh, of that, you are still to honor, to reverence, to respect your father and your mother. This is the first commandment of the promise. And verse 4, we have another statement added in that certainly ties in with this commandment, with you as parents teaching your children to properly honor you. You fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, don't goad your children. Don't humiliate your children. Don't pick at your children. Don't put them down and just push them and, and, and humiliate them and deal with them in such a way that you incite them to sin. That you provoke them to wrath, that you just push them to the point that they do or say something they should not. Because then God will hold you responsible for that also. You know, we, you as a parent, that doesn't mean you're not to discipline your child, but you're to discipline them in love and in a right way and not to misuse them or to abuse them. Colossians chapter 3. Similar statement. Colossians chapter 3, verse 20. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Obey your parents. You're a child, you're living under their roof, uh, you're, you're with them, you, uh, you are to obey them. Maybe you don't think they're right. Maybe they're not right. In fact, they're, nobody's going to be right 100% of the time. But, you know, as the saying is, the boss might not always be right, but he's always the boss. And I think children will find that uh, their parents are generally, you know, they, they're a lot more often right than, than you are as a child. Sometimes you don't think, sometimes when you're a child and you get a little older, Mr. Armstrong commented on the tape we heard a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he saw his father at age 18, and then it was about eight or ten years later that he saw him again, and he was amazed how much Dad had learned, you know, in the last few years. Well, I think that that's something that most of us find as we get older, uh, that the older we get, the more that we uh, understand why our parents said and did some of the things that they did in, in our behalf. So it just says, children, obey your parents in, the, in all things. This is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. You know, don't just put them down, put them down, put them down. Because the time will come, they'll become discouraged. They'll come to the point that they, they will lose, uh, they, they, they lose their self-esteem. They don't properly regard themselves, don't properly respect themselves. And someone who doesn't properly respect himself is not going to be able to respect anyone else. I think it generally comes out that way. An individual who does not respect himself generally doesn't respect anyone else. And it shows in his conduct with them. You know, when the scripture says, love your neighbor as yourself, it implies a right type of self-love. If you hate yourself, what does that say about your treatment of your neighbor? You know, if you love him the same way you love yourself, then uh, uh, he's going to uh, be on the, on the receiving end of some things. So it is important to have that proper regard and that is an important thing that parents need to realize. Too many times, too many children, too many adults, were brought up as children in, in wrong environment and have a lot to deal with. There are scars that are left in our lives that it takes God's help to overcome. Is this a reason to dishonor your parents, to hate them, hold it against them because, you know, they didn't rear me right. They didn't teach me right. Why, you know, my dad or my mom did this or did that. You have to realize, you know, they were the product. They were the product of their background. And the difference between you and them, you know, you're the product of your background, they were the product of theirs. The difference between you and them is God is working with you and you have a chance to overcome your background. They never really had that. And you need to honor and to respect and to esteem them uh, in the sense that they did give you life and to realize that, you know, God will deal with them and they're going to have lessons to learn. But... Feelings of bitterness and resentment will destroy the individual who holds it. No one can afford to hold those kind of feelings against anyone, certainly against their parents. Now, you know, the scriptures show that 
this commandment of honoring your parents does not just apply to someone when they're a child living at home. It applies to your conduct as an adult. Notice back in 1 Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 3. Here is Paul's instruction to Timothy as a minister. He said, honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any widow have children or nephews, the marginal rendering is grandchildren. If any widow have children or grandchildren, let them learn first to show piety or kindness at home and to requite their parents, to provide for their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. And she that is a widow indeed and desolate, doesn't have any family, doesn't have any children or grandchildren to help her out, trusts in God and continues in supplications and prayers day and night. Coming on down in verse 16. If any man or woman that believes have widows, you know, any, any church member have widows, uh, that, you know, mother, grandmother, or let them, the member, relieve them, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. And in verse 8 it mentions, if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, those of his own kindred, is the marginal rendering, those of his own kindred, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Now, it talks here that there is a responsibility that as a child, as that you have toward an elderly parent or grandparent, if they're incapacitated, if they can't take care of themselves, if they can't provide their needs, you have a responsibility to see after them. That is a part of honoring your parents. As you get older, it is not a matter of obeying them in that sense. You reach maturity and you have individual responsibility for your actions, but you should still honor them, esteem them, show respect to them, be ready to take care of them, to help them, to provide them for their needs, to do whatever you can do to, to help and to take care of them. You know, maybe it's inconvenient sometimes. Well, it was probably inconvenient for them to take care of you when you were a squalling little baby, you know, and I woke them up at 2 o'clock in the morning because you were wet and messy and hungry and everything else. And uh, so, you know, it, it goes both ways. That uh, it is important then that that is, that is a part of our responsibility, that if our parents are needy, uh, if, that we are to do what we can do that can be helpful to them. We are to be considerate of them. Notice in Mark chapter 7, Notice what Christ said. Mark 7, verse 9. He said unto them, unto the religious leaders of his day, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother. And whoso curses his father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say, a gift, a sacrifice, dedicated by whatsoever you might be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him or allow him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition which you have delivered, and many other things like things you do. Now, what this meant, the word Corban is, is the Hebrew word for sacrifice, and it's transliterated here in the Greek, and then interpreted to, to mean a sacrifice or a gift, something that was dedicated. According to the Jewish rabbis, any time anyone made a statement about any article, any item of clothing or money or anything, if, if you just said, you know, even off the cuff, well, that's dedicated to God, I'm going to give that to God someday, then, in, then that was, as far as they were concerned, that was set apart and you could not do anything else with it. You were not, you know, even if you didn't give it, even if you didn't take it down and present it at the temple anytime soon, uh, you were not free to dispose of it. You could, you could use it as long as you were using it until you got ready to give it away and there was no time limit on that, but you were not free to dispose of it to let someone else have it. And so what these individuals would do in order to get out from under taking care of their parents. Say, well, you know, I, I'm going to give all this to, uh, this is all Corbin, this is all dedicated to the temple. I'm going to have them donate all that someday. Now, they didn't get around to doing it anytime soon. 
But they said that. And then because they had said that, they were not free, according to rabbinical law, to dispose of it. So they had to tell their parents, you know, boy, I'd sure like to help you out, Dad. Yeah, I know, uh, you know, that uh, things are kind of rough for, for you and Mom. But see, I, I'm going to, I'm, uh, I'm planning on donating all that. I, I, I said something about that the other day. And I just can't, I can't give you any of it. Now it's all dedicated to God. You can sit there and use it as long as you're alive, but you can't dispose of it. And so they had concocted a nice little legal fiction to enable them to get around the law of God. Jesus Christ was not impressed. And he zeroed in on them for their transgression of one of God's commandments. The role that the church of God is to play in this end time, this society where we find a growing and a continuing uh, disregard and disrespect of authority, the destruction of the family unit, we have the statement, the commission that is given to us in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. A part of the very foundation, a foundational commission of this church, of this work, is to restore the family unit, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the father to uphold the family at a time when the family is under assault. You know, I, I'd like to conclude in terms of scriptures with the example of Jesus Christ himself. We're, you know, if, if we're a Christian, then Jesus Christ is living his life in us. And Jesus Christ set a perfect example and there are many places that we could go through, but I, I think just one is, is sufficient because it shows the attitude that Jesus Christ is playing. As he was going through the greatest, most horrible trial of his entire life, as he hung on the stake, his life's blood ebbing away in pain and agony, having undergone a brutal beating, having, you know, suffered unimaginable things, Instead of his mind being just on himself and woe is me, what did he say? John chapter 19, verse 26. Let's pick it up in verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Cleopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother, as he was there, died, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, John. He said unto his mother, woman or lady, it was a title of respect, doesn't really give the same connotation as in our English translation, but it was a, it was a title of, of great respect. Woman, behold your son. And he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. This is right before he died. The last thing he did was to see that his mother, who was a widow by this time, was taken care of. That's where his concern was. He set a perfect example. He kept his father's commandment, perfectly obeyed his father, and showed honor and respect to his mother right on down to the time of his dying breath, wanting to make sure that she properly taken care of, properly provided for. We have his example. Brethren, we need to understand that the very foundation of any right society is the family unit. The human family was given to us to picture and to represent the divine family relationship, to teach us of our relationship with God. In that sense, then, to prepare us for the kingdom of God. Satan is fighting an all-out war and attack on the family unit. He is trying to destroy marriages. He is trying to destroy families. He is trying to turn husbands against wives and parents against children, children against parents. And in this society, he is succeeding. 
Jesus Christ said that except for the work of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, to restore the family unit, the science of the earth would be smitten with utter destruction. Satan's way is the way of rebellion and hostility, of resentment toward authority. The carnal mind is enmity against God, not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Absolute rebellion and hostility and resentment against authority. To the degree that children are taught by their parents to reverence their parents, to honor their parents, to highly esteem their parents, to greatly honor them and respect them, and to honor that authority. To the degree that children learn that, they learn to tune out the influence of Satan the devil. To turn away from the influence that he is pervading this society with. Brethren, we need to study into, to understand more deeply, and to apply more fully and more completely in our lives the commandment that God gives us to honor our parents. Because that commandment is fundamental. Fundamental to our relationship with our neighbor and frankly fundamental to our relationship with God himself. Because after all, God is our Father.